What's good? Welcome to First Street Podcast. On today's episode of First Street Podcast, we have Mitch Tisler joining us today to talk a little Washington Commanders up and coming NFL draft, positions of need and things like that, not just quarterbacks. All right. Um, also, we will discuss uh, what happened this weekend. It was an amazing sports weekend. You had the NCAA finals, men's and women's. DC Defenders won caps. Yeah, not so great, but you also have WrestleMania. Maybe we'll have time to get into that as well. I hope y'all are ready. Let's go. Yeah. First stream podcast. Yeah. Two Danny. Dre on the beat. You know. Yeah. What's your favorite squad? Tell me who you going with. Where you going First with? stream podcast. Yeah, we keep it lit. We got the latest updates. We don't pump fake. Like, come and share it. We don't care. Feel free to hate. Hater. We got great guests. Join us. You should chime in. Trudini on the intro for the time being. Uh, Lady A. Representing Washington. Uh, Pick Washington. Everything Washington. Everything. Mo coming out of Dallas. You know the business. What? Said, them Georgia Bulldogs ain't quitting. Uh, yeah. If you ain't watching sports, you ain't living. About to get my mattress mac on. About to bet a million. Bet a million. Let's talk about it. We all going to cool. We can talk about it. Before we hit the news, we gon' talk about it. Oh, you wanna bet? Let's pop a bottle, bow. Yeah. What's good? Welcome back to First Spring Podcast. Do not forget to like and subscribe to First Spring Podcast. Give us that good thumbs up. Hit the bell to enable alerts for new content just like this. And the most important part is that you tell a friend to tell a friend about First Spring Podcast. I am your host, Toothpick. And it's time for me to get my other co-hosts in here as well as our guest. So first off, we're going to bring Sid in here. How are you, sir? What's going on, my brother? What's good? Hey, sounds like you had an interesting day today. Man. Yeah, you know. <laughs> did, you, did, did, you civic, did you civic duty, huh? Did you civic duty, yeah. huh? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. Well, while you was doing that, Lady A was running around here passing out fans and out FedEx. How are you, Lady A? I'm doing well. Um, it sounds like Sid was being nosy all day. Well, well. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you mouthing that. Because yes, that's what that's what jury duty is now. Jury duty is being nosy, huh? <laughs> just you just sit there and you're like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you get all the tea, huh? You get all the tea. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> all right, all right. Al's running. Al's coming in hot, so he'll be here later. Uh, little bro got the day off. He's taking care of some business as well. So let's bring in Miss Tischler. How are you, sir? Amen. I'm doing well, guys. Sounds like said just wanted to day off from work today. That's all. That's yeah. all he did. He really wanted. He, <laughs> he went down and volunteered. He he really went down to volunteer. That's what yeah. he did. He was like, Yo, y'all need an extra member. <laughs> they told Sam, "We're not even going to pay you for this, but <laughs> you just go." Ahead. Hey, speak of that. They done went up. It's not six dollars anymore. How about that? What is it? Ten? Okay. Twenty. Ooh. <laughs> oh, 20 for eight hours. I was gonna say, Sid, it ain't been six dollars in a long time, but okay. Sid, Sid hasn't been there in a while. Sid hasn't been right, there clearly. In a while. You know, my appearance fee just happens to be 20 bucks. There you go. There it is. <laughs> Sid, put the check in the mail. Put the check in the mail. There we go. So um, we're all here because this thing happens around this time of year where uh, we start getting ready for the NFL draft and uh, what's most called by Brian Mitchell as lying season. Um, we're not here to talk quarterbacks today. Not right now. We've talked quarterbacks quite enough, okay? Uh, we know who they are. Let's talk the, the backbone of your – your NFL team, you know, your, your offense and defensive line. And the best expert that we know, he's a Terp, is Miss Tischler. So let's get him in here and uh, talk about the draft prospects for the offensive line. Yeah, uh, listen, this is a very, very deep draft for uh, for offensive tackles. I think I was reading it's uh, tackles and wide receivers. If you need them, this is a draft to have top 100 picks in and I think when we look at this commander's roster, that's probably two places on offense outside of quarterback that they're probably going to attack. And honestly, it's going to be interesting to see how the tackle market plays out this year because 
there could be as many as eight guys that go in the in the first round. Um, and if you start including guards and, and centers, you could get up to 10 or 11 offensive linemen in that in that first round of the draft. So, I mean, it's going to be interesting for the commanders if they want to sit pat at uh, 36 or if they want to package a couple picks and get back in that first round and get a guy that they really like. But when you look at it, I think uh, if they stick around at 36, they are gonna they can probably get a guy like Jordan Morgan uh, out of Arizona. He's a guy that I've been um, pretty high on. I think he's a guy that can step in and, and – play maybe right away but pretty quickly even if it's not immediately um he's a guy who's a who's a mauler in the in the uh run game and, and uses his arms well in the pass game and has a lot of room to improve as well but but as a guy who can who projects out to be a you know pretty solid nfl starter so um you know there's a lot of different ways these, these this team can go but uh it's gonna be uh it's gonna be fun to watch all right. So you just said 10 to 11 offensive linemen. Now we're still not even talking about defensive linemen and the, the vast number of wide receivers. Plus, let's say, let's just say, I'm, I'm going to do some quick math here. Okay. Let's say five quarterbacks go in the first round. Right. And then we'll no. say, you think five are going in the first round? You never know. You never know. But he let's just say extra with his numbers. Let's That's say awesome. five quarterbacks go in the first round. You got 11 offensive linemen. Now um, let's 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 talk about these wide receivers. That's you know Marvin Harris Jr., the two wide receivers out of um, uh, uh, LSU. Don't forget about the two beasts out of uh, Washington. And let's just say let's go with six. We'll say six wide receivers. We haven't even got to edge rushers yet. Um, is there still going to be a possibility of your guy being there at number number thirty four or thirty six? Well, I, I don't know that edge rusher is going to – listen, they definitely need to add some edge rushers, um, I, but I think that might be more of a volume play mm -hmm. a little bit later in the draft because – No, 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 no. I was talking about the offensive tackle. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying oh, oh. if we said at edge rushers going in the first round as well, you know, but 11 offensive linemen, five wide receivers, we haven't counted in edge rushers, not even linebackers or, you know, none of that yet. So it's a possibility still of the guy that you said out of Arizona being there – for Washington at number 36. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we all know how the, the, the draft works. The, there are runs on players and runs on positions mm -hmm. as they go. I mean, you know, you're going to have the first three players are pretty much going to be probably be quarterbacks, probably a wide receiver to Arizona, maybe an offensive lineman to the chargers, or maybe a trade up for JJ McCarthy, kind of whatever happens there. <laughs> but when that run on tackles starts, which is, which is going to happen, you're going to have, you know, Joe Ald, uh, Ulu Fashanu, Talia Swaga, uh, J.C. Latham, the kid from Alabama, um, they the kid from from Georgia, uh, Amarius Mims, Washington. I mean, you just once these guys start going, they're gonna they're gonna start going. And I think the first time that there's kind of a gap between the the first rounders and the guys who might be a borderline first rounder is when you get mm -hmm. to Tyler Guyton, who's uh, the Oklahoma tackle. Um, I think that he's a guy that may end up going at the very end of the first round, just because a team wants that fifth year of control at the end of the at the end of his rookie contract. And ultimately, you know, the Ravens did an incredible job with Lamar Jackson when they traded back into the first round to get him with that yep. last pick, so that they could have that fifth year option for him. Uh, you know, a quarterback and a tackle on a rookie deal for five years sounds pretty good to me. In in, in my book, I, I think that I'd sign up for that right now. So. Um, maybe they trade back in, maybe they stick where they're at, but uh, they're going to be picking if they don't, if they don't make a move, probably either Tyler Guyton or, or, uh, or Jordan Morgan. Okay. So my first question for you really is where do you expect the first tackle to go off the board at? And I know Washington has the second pick and uh, uh, Chris Russell and Doc Walker were talking really crazy on the radio today. And I said, what if we start the crazy and pick a tackle at two? Where do you realistically expect the first tackle to go off the board at? I, I know you guys don't want to get into the quarterback conversation, and, and I'm happy to leave that conversation where it is. When you look at this year's crop of quarterbacks versus next year's crop of quarterbacks, and you're sitting at the number two spot overall, I think it's a spot that you got to pounce at. So right. I, I, right, as right. much as they need help at tackle, there's no doubt that they need help on the offensive line. They need help at quarterback too, and, and you got to go and get your guy when you have an opportunity mm -hmm. to do it. Right. Um, to me, I think five is the first spot. I think the Chargers pick at five. Yep. And yep. the question is going to be, is Jim Harbaugh 
gonna go out and you know help out his guy JJ McCarthy and go make a move with the Vikings to allow the Vikings to move up and go get JJ uh, with that mm-hmm. fifth overall pick. But if they end up sitting there and, and making that pick at five, it's hard to believe that they're not going to take uh, Joe Alt um, or, or some other offensive line help. But I think Joe Alt's probably the best guy on the board. All right, so five. Okay, say so get in there. Yeah, I'm I'm in agreement with the Chargers are going to take an offensive line. They need help on offensive line. Uh, now I'm in a disagreement with them taking a the quarterback. This is my personal opinion. I think I, I personally think if I'm still I'm going to say this again. I, I think Washington moved too early with the last quarterback. This is my personal opinion because I think he needed more help around him before they decided that, okay, this is enough for him to get rid of him. That's just my personal opinion. After watching him play those games where he had time, he's not talking games where he didn't have time. After watching the games where he did have time, he played well. Um, What are you guys going to do at defensive line? I don't think they're going to do a lot of defensive line. They brought in a ton of guys that they can rotate through. And, you know, between the the Dorrance Armstrong group, uh, Dante Fowler, uh, Cleveland Farrell, I mean, they brought in a lot of kind of veteran guys that can plug a hole for you for a year or two and and allow you to build up the rest of your roster. I mean, you know, as a whole, you look at this commander's roster and so much of the draft stock has been used on the defense over the past three, four, five years that there needs to be, you know, not an overcorrection because they still need a lot of help on defense, but they don't have stars on offense. And you kind of need to start adding those, especially in the league the way that it is today. You gotta you gotta have explosive plays on the offensive side of the ball. And that starts with having a quarterback, protecting him and allowing him an opportunity to get the ball out to his guys. And um, you know, they've they've made some kind of veteran-ish savvy moves along the offensive line. I think it's gonna be a big improvement based on what we saw last year. Adding uh Tyler Biotish at center is gonna be a huge underrated um signing. I know you guys are Dallas got Dallas folk. So no, um, no, 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 no. Ant, Ant's not here. Ant's the only one that's <laughs> Dallas. Oh, I thought, all right, all right. Ant, Ant's the only one that's Ant, Dallas. Yeah. But the point being that pairing a, a rookie center with a with court? a young a rookie quarterback with a young center makes it tough to me to be successful because both are learning on the job. That's why I think Ricky Stromberg is in a little bit of a tough situation. And I think he's right. in that situation because Ron Rivera and company kind of screwed up his development last year. Right. But um Bringing in a guy like Biotis, who's going to be able to help out your quarterback in terms of calling out defenses and, and identifying Mike backers and, you know, working with the O-line to to, uh, to to move him around and to be in the right places, I think is going to be a huge adjust, a huge addition uh, to the O-line. And so, you know, when you get a left tackle, when you have a tackle who you can kind of leave out on an island on one side of the ball, that helps out everyone else across the line. Because at that point, you can slide if your left tackle is your guy. You can slide your left guard, center, right guard, right tackle, all the other direction. Any chippers or any running backs, tight ends that have to, you know, kind of help out in in protection. You know, you can you can you can send them to the kind of the weaker side of the O line. So, I, again, I, I think quarterback and I think tackle are the first two first two picks mm-hmm. for this team, and then I think they have a lot of opportunities to uh, to go the direction they want to go. When you look at the rest of the, you know, the what is it, four other uh, top hundred picks. All right, right. Lady A. So um, I just want to let you know, I have been screaming for the past two drafts that they get someone on offense um, as far as their line. I, I really, that that's just my heart hurt when they didn't do that. They didn't yeah. address it the way that they should have, um, which, and I was, a, I was rooting for Sam. And you're right, you know, they need someone to protect the quarterback. And, and kind of to allude to what said, um, stated, they didn't develop him properly. He didn't have a lot of time. He just didn't have anyone in front of him. So with that said, new coach, um, I'm hoping that uh, Cliff is, you know, on it because we really need him to be. With that said, though, um, I saw something in reference to Washington hosting Washington's right tackle, um, Roger Rosengarten. And apparently he's extremely athletic. Um, 6'5", 308 pounds, but he was a red shirt junior. So how do you feel about 
having this guy come on board because apparently if they're hosting him, they, they see something. So how do you think Cliff is going to work that? And I'm hoping that we get. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's probably a, a fourth round pick, probably maybe early fourth round pick day three pick. Um, right. And so I, I definitely think that they need to add some, some depth and some guys that they're going to develop uh, as they move through this. And, and certainly He's a guy that could work because they do need a right tackle. I don't, you know, I think we all agree right. that uh, Wiley's not kind of the long term answer. Um, right. An interesting name that, that a dude that I'm kind of high on. I think he's going to be maybe mid third round or so. You know, depends mm-hmm. on how what teams want to do with him. Is uh, uh, Kieran Amagaji? He's the uh, mm-hmm. tackle out of Yale. Um, he basically mm-hmm. has all of the physical traits that you want out of a you know out of a tackle. Long arms quick, good shuttle, good shuttle time. Um, you know, the size and the strength, he's just something that hasn't played a whole lot of football. So he's a guy that's going to have to, he's, if you draft him, he's probably not going to be able to step right in and play right away. But, um, I do like the idea of adding kind of a mid, uh, late round, um, tackle and guard to and guard too. So that you can start, you know, kind of filling out the depth of the roster. You know, the biggest thing that I think Ron Rivera kind of failed at was, he created a roster with kind of a starting 22 and you can, we can argue whether they were good or not, but he had a roster of the starting 22 and there was just a huge fall off after that with the, with, with any injuries or, you know, guys having to miss time, whatever, for whatever it may be. And it just derailed everything the second that there was one injury on that team. So uh, I think that's something that Adam Peters did a lot in San Francisco. Not that he was, you know, the sole guy doing it, but we saw San Francisco build the depth, um, and I think that's something that's that's going to be important to do here. Yeah. All right. So we do have Alvin coming in right now. I have something for you here, Mitch. Um, so I'm sitting here looking at uh, Jordan's uh, measurements from the draft. Right. Uh, the thing that Sid's about to jump off off of a cliff on is this. Sid, his arm, his arm length is thirty two point eight seven five. Is that is that a good size arm for a tackle? Uh uh, Mitch, listen. Uh, I, I, nothing has changed from the time that they stopped playing football in January until the draft in April. And certainly, you can ding a guy for you know certain measurements along the way. But when you turn on the tape and you watch these guys play, you right. get a better feeling for who they are. And I say that when it comes to a second round tackle. I'll say that when it comes to the number two overall pick at quarterback, you know, we can pick and we can pick apart different measurements and different, right. uh, you know, analytics and, uh, you know, the advanced analytics, advanced analytics numbers as they go. Um, and yes, they are, they, they are a little short to be, uh, to be a tackle, but you know, it's not the, it's not the, it's not, it's not the end of the world for, for a guy like that. I, what, 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 what's his name again? His name's George Jordan Morgan. Uh, Morgan, Jordan Morgan. He played where? Arizona. That's all I need to know. <laughs> Pac-12. <laughs> Say it like you Pac-12. Okay, so um, Alvin's here. Alvin, uh, we're talking O-line, D-line right now with Mitch. Hold on real quick. Just, I, I want to just jump in real quick. Said, so uh, Drake May shouldn't go number two because he went to a small – because he went to the ACC where they don't play real good football? No, I can talk about an offensive line with short arms. I'm not talking oh, okay. about that. Yeah, yeah. Because we have one. In, in Atlanta. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what I'm saying. And his knock, on to my R's, his yeah. knock coming into the draft was he kept getting beat by speed rushers because he had short arm. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not saying Drake May. I mean, Drake May may do just that. But yeah, yeah I, I just. With the short arms? Oh, yeah. I'm all over that one. All over it. <laughs> all over it. <laughs> little T Rex. You, you sound a little pregnant. You sound a little pregnant. I didn't even have to do it. Look at you that. You sound a little pregnant, I mean, <laughs> I ain't, I, I ain't had to do that. Do not encourage this. <laughs> hey, say it goes off about baby T-Rex arms. At le- we have a whole segment about it. It's called leaking oil. So if you ever oh. see leaking oil, Stan will tell you about baby T-Rex arms and get oh, two, two step. Okay, Al, get in there, Al. Oh, man. I, I don't know where to go with this short arm thing, like I said. Because <laughs> <laughs> like I said, but in regards to I'm not sure. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm coming in so late, so I'm trying to. So I'm trying to catch up um, with with everything um, with, with with 
was bitch. Good afternoon, everyone, too. I, I apologize for being late, man. Work was, like I said, traffic was terrible, but that's neither here nor there. It happens. Yes, it does. Hey, but and, which, I guess, I, maybe I'm late to this question, too. But I know the Redskins need need, need a, a, a overhaul in the, at their offensive line, in in, in, in at their offensive line. And have y'all covered the, which offensive linemen the Redskins are, are, are covering, or in, 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 in different in different rounds? And what what in which rounds do you think, other than quarterback, you think the um, Redskins are going to go at offensive line? Yeah, so we we're talking about it a little bit. I think. Um... At their, I think after quarterback, their next pick will be an offensive tackle. Um, and whether that's at 36, if they stay there, uh, it'll depend on kind of what happens uh, as we go through the draft. But you really have to like what the commanders did with their offensive line in the offseason, or at least the interior of mm-hmm. the offensive line. You know, bringing in, I, we talked about Biotish a little bit earlier. I love uh, Michael Dieter and Mick Allegretti kind of battling out for that other starting guard job. Uh, you know, Sam Cosby is going to stay at right guard when he's there. Andrew um, Wiley is probably going to be your starting your starting right tackle, yeah. and I know a lot of Commanders fans are going to be frustrated about that. And that's why earlier when we talked about kind of having a, a left tackle that you trust, you can slide protections to, to help out kind of the weak link on the offensive line. And, you know, ultimately I think that's where we're going to get kind of a middle, middle of the draft um, addition uh, on the – middle of the draft tackle addition to, to hopefully grow in to be a starting right tackle in the future. But, you know, bringing back Cornelius Lucas is big. He's a guy who's proven that he can get out there and, and play. He's not going to go out there and be a, a pro bowler or an all pro, but he can, he's a solid vet who can get the job done. And so if he has to start at left tackle for, you know, a couple games to let the young kid get, you know, get adjusted to the NFL game, so be it. And then maybe at that point, because big Luke can play both sides of the ball if Wiley is continuing to struggle, you can move Big Luke over to the right side and and uh, you know move Wiley back into the the kind of backup swing tackle rotation. So they 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 have options. I'm not saying that the tackle options are spectacular, and you know fans should expect this to be a you know a, a top five offensive line. But I think there'll be market improvement uh, year over year uh, between b- between these guys. And good team, good teams usually draft right, for depth. So. Definitely, definitely. De- I'm sorry. Yeah. Definitely at the offensive line. The Redskins, we, I, I know they made a lot of red, a lot of improvements on the offensive line during during the off season. But like I said, I think just getting one tackle, I, I, w- I would imagine, I would I would hope that they would use multiple most of their picks on the offensive line because, like I said, that's a position that you can never have too much depth with. Yeah, I would I would expect over the course of the draft that they'll add two tackles and probably two guards or a guard slash center or something along those lines, but probably three or four guys um, across the board. Another big thing that we just got to, we don't know yet because we haven't, you know, really, they haven't really had a chance to see these guys on the field, but there's a lot of, you know, back end of the roster dudes, you know, who were mid to late round draft picks that Ron took that, you know, we didn't see develop the way that I think folks would have wanted them to, but you know, how do they feel about Chris Paul, Ricky Stromberg, you know, I guess to some extent, Braden Daniels, I, I kind of think he's going to be, he might be cut this year, which would be crazy for a fourth round, fourth pick, round but pick, but that dude was pretty, dude. pretty far off. Um, Mason Brooks is another guy who spent the entire time on the practice squad developing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I wanted him to get a little playing time at the end of the year last year, because I think he's a guy that might be able to help out in depth uh, on the offensive line. So there are some young guys here, okay. you know, on that, o, on that O line across the board that you you got to kind of evaluate with this new coaching staff and see how they look at this new group of guys, because, you know, obviously none of them took the big steps that everyone hoped they would have been with the previous regime. All right. So let's get to our chat and I apologize. I usually get into that, but we started talking about stand and jury duty. Bruce Glass was first in the building here today. John, hey, John has also arrived. <laughs> Dump Trip Don is here, and he introduced himself always as saying, Mr. We will get to the question of the month with myself and uh, Mitch Tischler here uh, right about the, at the end of Mitch's time with us today. So then I'll answer that question as well. George Fisher said this is some insightful conversation. And here's the question for you right here, Mitch. It's uh, what do you think they'll do to address the Andrew Wiley situation? Uh, I don't want them to move Cosme to tackle after they finally got – after he finally got some work um, at guard from last season. So I think it is already 
set that he is going to uh, stay at a uh, right guard. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe he will. Um, you know, the my most hated Ron Rivera ism was the position flex. Oh, you gotta take a drink bleep, every bleep, time you bleep, say bleep, that. Bleep, bleep. Good. No. Everyone should drink. No. You have four years of being drunk with that with that dude. Um, but I think particularly on the offensive line and then on the other side of the ball in the secondary, he really stunted the growth of a bunch of these guys by making them learn, you know, these multiple positions and not letting them improve. Uh, Ricky Stromberg is the one that sticks out to me the most. They were yeah. so desperate for guard depth last year that they didn't really work Ricky at center much in training camp and through the beginning part of the season. And it wasn't until they decided that they wanted to move on from Nick Gates that they really started giving him reps at, at center. And thus he never really progressed either at guard or at center, you know, becoming a player that, that the new regime could trust stepping in and playing. And I think you can say the same with Sam Cosme, the snip, snap, snip, snap back and forth between guard mm -hmm. and tackle within the same game at times was ludicrous and you don't see anyone else across the NFL doing crazy stuff like that. And so you're seeing the situation where you're seeing these guys, you know, not progressing and not becoming better football players because they're clouding their heads too much with a bunch of, you know, with a bunch of different stuff. And, you know, I mentioned the secondary and, and I look at guys like Percy Butler and Derek Forrest and, you know, those guys, you know, who knows what they can ultimately end up being, but running around in that Jack Del Rio defense you know, they weren't playing free-form football. They weren't playing relaxed, reactionary football. They were thinking and trying to figure out where they're supposed to be, play to play to play. And you saw that at times when these guys are getting burned deep because they're sitting there thinking, okay, you know, do I have the first, do I have the third of the field, the fourth of the field? What am I, you know, where am I supposed to be? And so mm -hmm. I think that, you know, without trying to take too many shots of the previous regime, having – successful competent coaches on both the at both the coordinator positions I think will go a long way mm -hmm. uh, in player development and I think fans hopefully can start getting the idea in their head that it's okay for a third or fourth round player to be a starting level player you know that doesn't really happen with the commanders over the past you know four plus years you know with this team guys don't step in and play right away they don't develop into long-term starters they 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 sit in this you know limbo of being a half starter backup, we don't know what we want to do with them. And uh it's it really it just hurts so many of the so many guys' developments. And honestly, Jamin Davis can be included in that group too, because he should be able to play a lot freer this year, having both Bobby Wagner and Frankie Louvu back there or in the mm -hmm. middle of the field. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how they how they deploy him as well. All right. So let's talk about positions. We're still not talking about quarterback. Um, other than the offensive line right now, which I like to call the cousins of the offensive linemen because they can catch passes and they can block the tight end position. Besides Brock Bowers, what other tight end is in this draft that should be able to step in and make some uh, contributions to the team? Uh, so to be honest with you, I haven't gone deep on tight ends because All right. I don't see I don't see them really taking a tight end until – you know, the back end of those top hundred picks at best. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, you're probably looking at um, the kid from Florida state. Uh, his name is uh, bell. Um, I think right. he's a, he's, he's got the uh, kind of the size and the speed to be a little bit of that, that dual threat. You know, I love Ola Fashano on the offensive line from Penn state. You also have uh, um, uh, who's the Penn state, uh, the tight end. tight end. He's, he's a, Big dude, six 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 seven, something like that. I'm looking for him. Clocks now. in at two fifty, two sixty. Um, but there are a couple dudes there that I think uh, there are a couple dudes there. I think in the middle that could step in and help. But I think that you know this is a in general as we talk about positions of need, this is a football team that's not going to be able to fill every position of need this off season. And I think that's why you saw the way that they worked in free agency, bringing in a couple of these veterans and some depth veterans at different positions to allow themselves to not be have their hand forced when we get to the draft. And, you know, we need it. We need a DN right now. So we got to take, we got to take an edge rusher or we need a tight end, you know, so we're going to, we, we got to, we got to maybe reach for one. So I, I like what they did in free agency because it allows them to, for the most part, take best player available when they, when they get on the board. And maybe if you want to get a little deeper, best player available at a position of need per se. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, tight end is tight end wide receiver, tackle, quarterback on the offensive side of the ball. 
defensive side of the ball, I think you're looking at, you know, corner slash secondary. I'd like a little more depth at, uh, at linebacker. And I, I they will add an edge rusher in this draft. But I think when you look at what they did this offseason, it's not going to be a high priority edge rusher. All right. Um, okay. Uh, say it, Lady A, and then uh, Alvin, and then we'll go to the question of the month for Mitch. Um, Go ahead, Sid. I mean, yeah. Uh, one of one of the things that I I did notice, um, like it was already brought about the, about the tight ends. Um, Cause we're talking about Cliff Kingsbury. We're talking about the type of scheme that he brings to to the field. So one of the things that he does not bring is tight end play. Um, even though they signed a high end tight end from Philadelphia to come out there, they didn't really use tight end. So point out a few wide receivers that you think the uh, commanders could be targeting. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of them, and being such a deep wide receiver draft, it's not True. something that they're going to have to have to jump up for. I think. You know, depending on where they end up sticking around, if uh, Lad McConkey from from Georgia ends up sitting there at forty, uh, you hate him. <laughs> they need to see him. Great, 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 that's right. I forgot you were a Georgia dude. Yeah. Listen, I think that they need they need they need a guy with some shiftiness that they can throw in the slot. And the two things they need, slot and then somebody who can kind of take it take it deep over the top. And uh Keon Coleman is another dude from Florida State that I think is a is a would be an interesting guy because he has kind of the 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 height to be both a red zone target and be able to get deep. Going back inside of the slot, I think um the Michigan kid, uh Roman Wilson would be interesting. Uh, you know, I, I don't, it's hard to kind of, for me, read how good the Michigan wide receivers are because they rely so much on that run game. So it, it makes it a little interesting. Xavier Leggett from uh, South Carolina, another dude that would be interesting. I, I, I don't know that they're going to end up going this route, but I really would like to see them go quarterback tackle wide receiver first three picks because mm -hmm. they need that explosiveness on offense. They right. need to do something that can, uh, they need, a, they need some game changers on, on that offensive side of the ball. Now, let me, let me, let me say this real quick about Lad McConkey. Uh, um, he's picking up steam. I don't know if any, anyone's been really paying attention that he's been getting a lot of back backdoor comments mm. where people really mm. like his speed and his route running. And he, he, was, he was slated to be a second-round pick, but they think now he may not make it out of the first. Oh, right, and that's the kind of the new age NFL. Like mm -hmm. you know, because defenses are so hamstrung by the rules, these you know surgical route runners find a way to get open. You know, you look at the Rams' offense as a whole. Everything that Sean McVay's done out there, none of those guys are the fastest, the tallest, the quickest, the best route. But they can all they can all run a run a run a route and get themselves open. And True. that's why you're going to see a lot of these. You know, used to be the prototypical. You needed a six-five wide receiver to, you know, to be successful. You're going to see a lot of these. You know, we talked about the uh, the T Rex arms for the for the o line. The tackles. Yeah. We're going to have a couple of these. Uh, you know, these these uh, these uh, Munchkins out there running running routes and getting open uh, from the receiver position too. As long as they route titians, remember you heard that word here, route titians. <laughs> <I like laughs> we we'll, we'll like it. Lady A, get in there. Okay, so I have actually a two part question. First question is on the offensive side. How likely do you think it will be to get that young man from Yale, the one I don't want to mess up his name? And then also, if we drive someone on the other side of the ball for defense, who do you think Joe is looking at? You know, what what top person could fit his scheme um, or, you know, just the way that he coaches to go along with his style? Yeah, I mean, are we talking a dream world? I think dream world, you know, we'd love to have Chop Robinson drop to them in some capacity, uh, you know, from Penn State and be, you know, kind of your your big time edge rusher if that's where they go. Um, but I think that, you know, there's a, there's so many young guys on the defensive oh, side of the ball and guys that can do some different things that I, I don't know that they're going to be, 
I don't know that there's a lot of a lot of uh, you know reaching for a guy on the defensive side who you think is going to be able to step in and and make a big difference right away. Because when you look at again what they did in the off season, they they put together. You know, you probably can figure out who your starting eleven is across the board, and maybe there's some battles that you know a corner who's going to you know who's going to be your corner out there, and maybe a little bit of safety as well. So I do expect them to add to the secondary in this draft. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, the uh, Kieran Amagaji, he's such an interesting prospect because there's so he's really raw, and it's going to take an uh, offensive line coach to really put the you know the athleticism into a football player's body. You know, you, there's a lot of guys who are super athletic, um, but might not be great football players. You know, Chase Young te- tests off the board with every athleticism, and there are times that he entirely disappears in a football game. You know, you have guys who aren't as athletically gifted who find a way to go make plays and and uh, and be good. So just because the guy is super, you know, athletic and tests off the board with all the RAS scores and whatnot isn't necessarily mean doesn't necessarily mean that that guy is going to be, um, you know, turn into a great football player. So it's really going to come down to, to Bobby Johnson and, you know, kind of what he does on the offensive line. If they want to, if they want to bring in a project like that, and they very well might not want to, because you know they they do have, you know, two or three, two two reasonable tackles already on the roster, and you know you don't want to necessarily, you know, bog down the roster with with guys who, um, with guys who are going to definitely take a year or two to develop into kind of a starting starting level player. Right. Okay. All right. Was that both sides of your question right there, Lady A? Yes. All I right. think so. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, that's also Alan. Yeah, um, what influence do you think Cliff Kingsbury is going to be able to have on this draft in regards to getting some toys for its offense? You know, it, it's interesting because um, with with uh, with new offensive with new coordinators as a whole, do you want to draft players that fit that scheme, or do you want that coordinator to adjust his scheme to the players that you have? And to me, I think that there are a lot of big egos in the NFL, especially on the offensive side of the ball. And you see guys who say, hey, my scheme is good. If you do what I tell you to do, you're going to be open and don't necessarily worry about the strengths of the players that they have. I think we saw that with Scott Turner um, a while ago. And I think, you know, maybe at the worst of it, we saw last year with Eric Enemy, who obviously just refused to run the ball. So I do think that there needs to be a little bit of a balance between bringing in players that fit Cliff Kingsbury's system, Mm -hmm. but also are good football players. And I think that's where you need Dan Quinn to step in and, and, you know, make sure that they are, they are creating an offense around the players that they have, because you're drafting these players to have for, you know, four, five plus seasons. Mm -hmm. There's no guarantee that your coordinator is going to be there that entire time. And so, you don't want to draft guys that are specific to Kingsbury who wants to get the ball out quickly to both sides of the field and, you know, and down the field who wouldn't be able to be successful in a different kind of offense per se. So uh, I think there's a balance between, you know, bringing in guys that fit what Cliff does and also bringing in, you know, making, making sure that Cliff knows that, you know, you're not, you're not jamming a square peg into a circle hole, but ultimately the most important part of it is that Adam Peters is a guy that's running the board. And mm-hmm. he's the guy question. that's in charge. There's not a lot of questions about that. You know, we saw for 25 years, you know, when there wasn't really a leader in that room, mm-hmm. what happened in the draft. And if you want to say specifically the last four years and, you know, probably the four years prior to that as well, you know, you see what happens when, you know, there's there's not a leader in the room and your guy gets picked right before you guys go. And then there's panic and you don't know what to do. I think having the, the the stewardship of Adam Peters is going to be a a big part of uh, this team drafting in a more professional manner. Doesn't mean they'll be successful. I I just think you're going to see them go through the process and the steps the correct way. And ultimately, it comes down to the players and coaches making it work on the field. But they should be it should be a a, a professional draft. That was kind of my next question. That was my next question too, me real quick. With Adam, do you think he'll take the um, approach they did with San Francisco, where they had such a deep roster at several positions with a lot of hybrid private players and things along those lines, where you had, like I said, their 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 cuts were always some of the first picked up. 
during, during the off season with being, being at San Francisco. And I think they did that by drafting a lot of hybrid players or having been deep in a lot of good, getting a lot of good players on the roster. Yeah, I, I like the combination of what we saw Peters do in San Francisco and also what Dan Quinn did in uh, Dallas and then um, Seattle before that as well. I don't mind if there are a couple Swiss Army Knights. I think every team needs a couple Swiss Army Knights who has mm -hmm. position flex. Um, it's okay to have a couple of those guys. You just can't do that with everybody across the board. Right. And so I think, you know, the, the way that, that Dan ran that defense with Joe Witt in, in Dallas, you know, with putting guys in a good position to be successful, you know, kind of balancing, you know, taking chances to, you know, to, to create turnovers versus getting beat deep, I think is, is going to be an interesting kind of uh, plot to follow along. But um, the, the building the roster kind of one to 55 or 53 is going to be super important. And that's not something that, that the commanders have done in years. And, and I mentioned it earlier in the show, you know, at so many positions, they were so thin, one injury away from, you know, total Fall collapse. Off right. Off so I, I think that I think they'll do a better job of building depth. All right. Thank you for that. Now it's time for the question of the month. So it is draft season. We've been talking draft since we had you here. So our question of the month revolves around four different picks. All right. So the first one, you and I both have to answer this um, because everyone else has done their part already. Um, the first one is. Um, who's your all-time favorite draft pick? Oh, boy. Um, Brian Arakpo or Trent Williams? And I think I'll lean Trent just because of his his continued success. Um, we, when we were NBC Sports, we were partners with the Commanders. And whenever the teams, um, whenever the teams, uh, whatever the team had as their first round pick, we would usually fly out to their hometown city or their college mm -hmm. city and do a kind of big profile on them. And uh, the time that I spent in Austin with Brian Arakbo and his then then girlfriend turned into wife um, was just awesome. I mean, so cool seeing, you know, he was just such a down to earth guy. He was, you know, obviously a good football player that some bad injuries or whatever, but, you know, just, just kind of spending a little bit of time with him. We went, we went bowling one night. we, you know, had some dinners or whatever. He's just a great dude, and and I really uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. All right, so mine is a Hall of Famer, and that would be Art Monk, um, one of the first players that I ever really just adored. Anyway, well, you know how that goes. Had that good admiration for what that was Art. So the next one is um, a player that pre that a pleasantly surprised draft player, a drafted player. Uh, for me, that player just left, and that would be Cam Curl. For him to be drafted so late to come in to make the impact that he did, that's the person that uh, actually surprised me. Seventh round draft pick came in and did his thing. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Um, certainly a really good recent one. Um, I'm trying to think going back over my years covering this team, kind of where some of the kind of fun – middle uh late round pick guys were um and it's kind of kind of hard coming up with a dude let's see um oh you know who's a good one chase Rouillet. he was a the sixth chase. round pick in 2016 7 chase 2017 i think yep um you know no one expected much out of him dude stepped up and uh you know found a way to be uh be a pretty successful center for a bunch of years and i was sad to see him retire when he did yeah. So this one right here, um, a player that you wanted the team to draft, but they didn't, but they went to a different team to become and went on to become great. Um, oh. our, I know where Don is going with this question. And for me, it's probably the same person. It's a linebacker that has two, two Super Bowl rings right now. He plays with Kansas City. It's Bolton for me. Yeah, uh, that's a really good one. Um uh safety for the Ravens, Kyle um Hamilton. Thank you, Kyle Hamilton. That's that's one that that sticks out. JOK in Cleveland, that's another one uh that sticks out. Um I think those are those are probably two pretty good ones. I'll tell you what, I love John Ross coming out of Washington a couple of years oh ago. Oh my god. Because I wanted them to be able to have a guy that could that could extend down the field. 
I think he went to Cincinnati and flamed out pretty damn quickly. So just because, uh, you know, not, not not always every guy you want turns into the the player that they that you think they're going to be. All right. And the last one is your biggest disappointing, your biggest disappointment as a draft pick. Uh, for me, that was Westbrook. The wide receiver out of Colorado. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a good one uh, for me. It's, it's hard not to say Chase Young. Uh, I hate it. Um, you know. I, I like Chase. I think he's a good dude. I, I whatever happened here that he never kind of got his feet under him and was able to turn into the football player that we thought he was going to be after that that rookie year. Uh, pretty frustrating. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know some of it uh, certainly needs to be blamed on the you know the I guess then Redskins Washington Football Commanders kind of rehab staff and and the group that they had in there, which you know mm-hmm. wasn't a particularly. Uh, uh, great staff that, that, that great working environment. Yeah. Um, but you know, there were, there were plenty of other off the field things that, you know, got in his way as well. So, right. you know, could you, you know, imagine could you... if Chase was sitting there and he was, you know, you know, a Watt or, uh, you know, or, you know, any of the other Ohio state edge rushers that have come out and was just a superstar that you could pencil in for double digit, you know, 12, 13 plus sacks every year. I'd be happy to pay him, you know, five years, whatever. 125 mil, whatever the number was, mm-hmm. you know, to keep him happy if he was if he if he was able to be that guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mitch, want to thank you again for uh joining us. Uh we got one more question for you. It comes from the uh, chat. And I don't know if you can answer this question. I hope you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the wildest thing you've seen on as a camera operator in NFL that wasn't caught on camera? Uh, there, there are two things that I caught on camera over my years, and they were both kind of a long while ago. Uh, one of that, I won't mention the players' names, but we were in um, a cold weather city, and the guys were uh, the team was with the Commanders or the Redskins were winning. The guys were on the bench, kind of fucking around. You could see, sorry, sorry, well, no worries, no worries, no worries. <laughs> uh, you know, you could see your breath, and a bunch of dudes were like kind of pretending to smoke jays. And this is before all of that stuff got legalized and whatnot. <laughs> the next, <laughs> the next week, two of the three players that were messing around like that got suspended for mm-hmm. uh, for smoking for smoking uh, weed. So okay. that I like they got suspended. And I was like, I have the best video ever. Couldn't show it. <laughs> um, the other one was uh, London Fletcher used to throw up before games. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was such a legendary thing that everyone talked about. But, you know, being on the sidelines, I was like, how have I never seen this before? And so one game midway through it, uh, one game midway through, who knows, the 20, 2009 season or so, I was just on him the entire pregame, following him all around the field, walking around. And finally, right before the national anthem, I, I saw him lean over and, and boot into a trash can behind the commander or behind the Redskins uh, bench at the time. So that was a that was a fun kind of fun little uh, wild thing that not everyone uh, knows about. So it's not just Willie Beeman that gets nervous before a game. <laughs> it's not just Willie Beeman. With a naked women, right, man. And naked women room across the field and stuff like that. No, 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 no. I, 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 didn't, I, 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 mean, I can only think of one or two streakers in the entire time. That, the NFL doesn't really have streakers that often. It's, right. it's not that much. I'll tell you another one. We were in Seattle for a game. I don't remember who the receiver was. But one of the Seahawks receivers uh, took a shot over the middle of the field and was just knocked completely out. And the the the, the, the medical staff comes in and they're kind of like holding him up, like you know, and they, they're like kind of you know rubbing the top of his head, trying to get him to like come back to life. And you just see him like pop his eyes open, and they and he goes, "Where the f am I?" And he's like looking <laughs> around, like not focusing on any. Like it was wild. I was like. Please get that guy to the locker room. Like, let's get let's get this thing moving. Maybe. Oh God! Thank you for your time, Mitch. We really do appreciate it. Uh, hit me up tomorrow, anytime. I'll I'll take your call when you when you hit me up. That's Miss Tischler from yes, Monumental Sports. You can catch him and JP on the, the you, Beltway Mitch. podcast, where they cover pretty much everything Washington, but mostly Commander stuff as well. Um. When is your pod coming? Is it is it still daily now, or is it uh is weekly? Uh, off season, we're gonna we're doing two a week. Um, usually Mondays and Thursday or Friday. Uh, 
for those who are in the DC area, DC DMV area, uh, we're on Monumental Sports on TV uh, Saturday and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. And yep. obviously, check out the pod wherever you get your good podcasts. Yes, sir. Thank you again. Thank you, Mitch. I appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Have a good All one. right. Okay. Listen, this was one of the best sports weekends ever, right? Um, not only because you had your uh, your Final Four, but because you had Lady A's cousins going at it. The WWE. <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. First off, let's do this. Let's talk about the ladies because the ladies are first, okay? Dom Staley and the South Carolina Gamecocks complete a perfect season. Uh, what a game. Caitlin Clark, Caitlin Clark comes out firing 18 points first half, second half 12 points. Um, they said it was the Raven Revenge Tour, and Raven did her thing. She locked her down. What did you guys see in that game uh, from your point of view? Because I was working. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I saw coaching. I saw a fabulous coach. I saw a fabulous coach make adjustments after that first quarter, and because um, it, it, it on the pace that Caitlin was going on, she was a seventy a seventy two point pace after the first quarter, and I think John Don Staley made some quick adjustments in that second quarter, and they just chipped away, and you saw the, the, the you saw how a, t- a, t- a team beats a player, and I mean like I said, it was it was a talented team, and they just had too many dogs. Too many dogs against the big dog, and mm-hmm. they did. They just wore down. They 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 they, they covered her for ninety three feet, and they kept a hand in her face, made her work. Because in the third and fourth quarter, like she didn't even want the ball at times. She right. was waving them off. So I mean, so I just think Don Don Staley does not get enough credit as being a great college basketball coach, win, 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 women's or men's. Um, and like I said, I think she should get some. Maybe she gets some looks for the Kentucky job, but that's just me. I heard that a few other places as well. <laughs> hey, but um, but um, and but it's bound to happen soon. It's bound to happen soon. Hey, man, like they said, they mean, <clears throat> I doubt in, in the in, in NBA, but in college, I think she can reach some of those kids. I think you know, like I said, I think she would definitely. She knows how to reach young people, and I and I, and I think that crosses over whether men or women. And I would love to. I think she would be a fantastic candidate. To be someone who could cross over and possibly have some success if they gave her the patience and gave her the support she would need. All right. Go ahead, lady. I get in there. So I saw greatness. Um, I did see really good athleticism. Um, Caitlin is a good player. I'll give her that. Definitely. Um, she deserves all this the kudos that. You know, a lot of people have been giving her. However, she is one person. Mm-hmm. And the reason to what Alvin said, the reason why you got a team full of dogs, because their coach was a dog as a player and is a dog mm-hmm. as a coach. Naismith that's award winner. Get when you have this. That's that's the greatness. So although we yes, we saw a great game, but we saw that the icing on the cake is we also saw great coaching. She deserves that coach of the year that she received. She deserves all the accolades. Kudos to her. I like to see Dawn win. And that's what she was doing. I mean, you're right. Caitlin kind of got shut down. I mean, like I said, she's one person. And, you know, not to be corny, but, you know, when they say there's no I in team, yeah, that, that's what we saw. She, yeah, she, Alvin yeah. used to say there's not an I, but there's a me. Give me the ball. That's yes, sir. Well, but, that's what Kobe said. Kobe but, said there's an ME in it, and you know what he said. So, yes, it definitely. is. However, Caitlin, she can't you can't carry that team on your back, not in that circumstance. No, no, but, I, but I, Don, she, but Don okay. showed true class after the game with her comments as yes. well. She yes. Caitlin, I think, like I said, like you said, Lady A, the coach, the players take on the personality of the coach, and right. you saw that with their, their tenacity. With their with their defense, with their what with, with their um with, with, with how they executed throughout that and with the adjustments, especially that second half. So, like I said, number kudos to the whole South Carolina um, coaching staff and team. Yeah. Well, said put a ton of money down on Caitlin Clark and uh, mm. the Iowa the Iowa Hawkeyes. Uh, who you mad at? Said who you mad at? <laughs> no, I mean um, I, I watched the whole game. I mean, mm-hmm. I did. I, I found it. I found it interesting from the beginning to the end. 
And I, I will say Don Stella did just that. She yeah. she she saw the girls a little tight early the first few minutes. She didn't panic. She made subtle adjustments. People don't realize that that she took five brand new players. Five. You know, let me let me say it again for the people in the back. She took five brand new players, transfers, freshmen, blended them, and just won a natty. For those kids who think they want to go to a team for stats. She said that too. She said that. She said, don't come here. Yep. I want players who are willing to be a part of a team. Right. And that team just won. Her third championship. Right. In five years. Three out of five. And she she said she's trying to go back again. Yep. Three out of five. I so think it helps too. about the coaching. Yeah, she now, already put now, it on them. She the already players, put it on the players. The players mm-hmm. executed. Yes, they, they did not. what they were supposed to do. They made they they actually found this from a previous game played against Iowa that gave her problems. Um, mm-hmm. I want to say Illinois. I can't mm-hmm. remember the name of the team right now. Top of my head. Uh, I think it was Ohio State. It was Ohio State? No, they said State. it during the game. I don't remember who it was. I'm talking about. I'm sorry, but they said that that game. <laughs> Gave her problems, and only thing South Carolina did was turn it up to the next level. They they met her nine or four feet down. She had to come when she was trying to bring the ball from out of bounds. There was somebody on her making oh, her man. work up the field. Yep. Oh, so man. once she got on the other side of the court, she was giving the ball up. They was trying to keep the ball in hand. They know they know at some point she's gonna get a shot off, but they wanted to limit the amount of shots she was getting. And, let, and like Alvin said here a few minutes ago. In the third and fourth quarter, she was tired. Yeah. Yep. She was tired because them young freshmen was going to the rim. They weren't mm-hmm. staying out there shooting threes. They shot them if they came to them. Yeah. But they was going to the rim. Yep. They was taking it to the rack. Get on your A game. And wh- how much do you all think helping did it, did it help? Not not so much maybe the players because they had five new players, but the fact that this coaching staff who Caitlin Clark lit up last year in the final four. To keep them from going, uh, from making the three in a row when they beat them last year in the final four, seeing that in the all factor and being able to know what you didn't do last year and what you needed to do this year in regard to changing the strategy against them. Well, you got to run the tape. You got to run the tape. You got to run the good and the bad. You got to see where you messed up, but you got to see where other people improved and, and kind of what Sid was talking about the game that, that the team gave Caitlin problems that's what mm-hmm. you got to study that too so that you can make a real adjustment so i feel like you know the fact that they lost it may have given them drive but yeah you mm-hmm. run that tape you look at what you did wrong but you also look at what other people did right because right. real talk you can look at the the tape from the last championship you can mm-hmm. you can study study angel study that you know so you run the tape. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do. All right. So uh, now let's talk about the men's side real quick. Um, you had the UConn Huskies come in who absolutely blazed their way through this uh, NCAA tournament field. Um, I think their toughest test was Alabama uh, because Alabama was going to get some points up. They were going to get their shots up. They were going to get some points in. Um, I did catch some of this, some of this right here, uh, some of this game. And uh, Edie and uh, and UConn's big man, oh, they showed, both of them showed that, hey, we know you guys can shoot, but big men are still relevant in yep. basketball. Uh, say it, go ahead, get in there. Yeah, the, um, they showed during this game. I watched, I watched most of this game because I missed some of it. But early on, they was going down in paint. Yeah. There was a hesitation. It didn't make a difference which one the big men was. They was throwing it to the paint and letting them deal with it first. And then if it came off the rim, they was pushing it outside. Mm -hmm. The only difference was UConn's men were hitting their shots. Mm -hmm. That was the big difference. If if there was a contested three, they stepped in four, four, five feet, shot that deuce, went on back down the court. Purdue, they was missing those shots. And that's what cost them. And that's how the lead is built slowly, slowly, slowly. Because – Purdue wasn't hitting them the same shots that UConn was hitting. Purdue wasn't hitting. The big man was doing the same now. But, again, this is a team game. Yep, 7-4 versus 7-2. 7-2 versus 
So it's not that big of a difference, you know. Plus, UConn's big man is a little bit more athletic than Purdue's big man, Lady A. I mean, I completely agree. Um, but what I disagree with, not from any, anyone on the team, I mean, uh, on here, um, they already talking about a three peat here and do this. And what they, Did they, 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 just, they just finished the most dominant. Yeah, postseason run in the history yeah. of college football. I, I, it. I feel like it was. It was that, that, I feel like yes, it was a good game, but goodness, let let them bask in right now. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Nope. <laughs> nope. nope. Like, Don't forget now. This how team, many people leaving the team? How many people leaving the team? Maybe only two. Yeah. And and uh, they lost their top Cash. two scores last year. Yeah. They lost their yeah. top two scores last year. Yeah. It came yeah. back and was more dominant this year. So with the transfer portal and the way that her coaches, it's not uncommon to think about a three P. And what you just said, what you just said, Pitt, I don't think as weird as he may be and 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 as different as his style may be, Danny Hurley may be the best coach in college basketball right now. And I say this for this reason. If you watched how he was able to implement his game plan and get his team to stick to that game plan. Their game plan was almost like what the previous game of Tennessee. Edie can get his, but no one else is going to get theirs. They held Purdue to the lowest three-point attempts. Not even just makes, but three-point attempts. I think they said like almost on like 18, 15 or 15, almost over 15 years. Mm-hmm. Seven attempts for a team that shoots 40% a clip and, and led the Big Ten. That, I mean, like I said, for you to keep your players engaged in the game plan, to even when Edie was going and getting his, not to double down, but to stay on the outside, to where they couldn't even get a shot of tip off, I was mesmerized by the defense that I watched mm-hmm. in that game. I was just like, man, these guys are suffocating. It was the true definition of suffocation on a, on, on, on a, with a defensive effort that I've seen in a long time. It, was, oh, it took me back to that Georgetown Press back in the early 80s. I mean, yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is another coach that buys into a team aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you've seen also UConn players pass up open shots to get a better shot. So the two coaches that won this year, both are not individual based. They are team based. Sacrifice a little bit of yourself for the betterment of the team and look at what happens. Look at what happens. So, uh, Lady A, we're about to shift this up a little bit, okay? You're about to get uh, the uh, spotlight. Well, no problem. No As problem. you will, because you're about to talk a little bit of DC defenders now. Yes. So my dear cousin Jordan, um, the quarterback for the DC defenders, did the thing. Um did so, the thing. so let's just go back. We're we're at week two for the UFL. And the first week, week one, uh the defenders were away. Yeah. And they lost. Yeah. The fans were a little confused because we're not used to losing. However, they came to D.C. They came home. And How do you feel? They remain undefeated. Um, in the game, my, my dear cousin, Jordan, finished with 212 passing yards, um, scored twice. They won the game 23 to 18. Mm-hmm. The crowd was uncontrollable at one point. That's out to the rowdy section. Right. And and shout out to uh, DJ Woody. He um, comes on to our podcast. He's done the left hand up um, song. And, and he also did uh, Let's Go the Team, Let's go team. With, the, with the Defenders. Um, Woody took a trip over to the rowdy side and came back drenched in beer. So um, you beer don't snake got to get fed somehow. My type of crowd. <laughs> my type of crowd. Free beer, baby. <laughs> So, I mean, it was it was out of control, but rightfully so. Um, it was a little scary um, at times. There were a few bad calls and, and missed calls that led people to think that, hey, this might be a fixed game, but it doesn't matter. We um, pushed through, um, did what we needed to do, and, I mean, they're, they're undefeated. Um, there were a couple times where you know they did try to capitalize on some um 
turnovers and they weren't able to be successful. They may have gotten a field goal or something like that. But it was also interesting to see the change in the kickoff, um, which their old version, the NFL has adapted. So that was fun. Um, but John, that's terrible. Um, but I understand. <laughs> um, but, uh, and you guys were talking about, um, different players, uh, shout out to the, to the roughnecks. Um, they, uh, came and they had a lot of injuries on their team. I'm not sure what was going on, but the defenders, when they play at home, they're very physical. Um, uh, so a couple of their players did kind of have to leave, um, mm -hmm. they had a player carted off and things like that. So, oh. um, prayers up to them. Um, but it, it is a physical game. Um, Lucky Jackson, uh, who was pri previously on the defenders as number 11, who's now with the, uh, Vikings, he showed up. Um, but yeah, we had a good time. Um, right. my, my my older cousin wasn't there because he was kind of busy and you can talk Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that here in a second, but I got a challenge now, okay? So uh, write this email address down, all right? You got to write this email address down. So here's the challenge. If you see Lady A at a defense, a D DC Defenders game, take a picture with her, email us. I will, I will, e I will send you a $50 Amazon gift card. Oh, oh boy. The key yeah. is you got to take a picture with her. This is weird, Waldo. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. If you see Lady A, because she's Definitely always there. Me. You see Lady A, she's always at the Defenders games, but you got to catch her because she goes to that private box. So you got to catch her <laughs> going in or coming you know out. It's funny. I was walking up the stairs and someone saw me. They were like, Lady A. I was like, huh? You know? So, yeah. See, if they're taking a picture the with you. They, hey. <laughs> no, I was like, who's following me? You gotta catch her. That's the, that's the trick. You gotta catch her. Yes. You see, lady, doing the, the UFL season. You take a picture with her. Email us at firststringpodcast at gmail dot com. Mm -hmm. A podcast is podcast is part of it too. No sir, no sir, <laughs> no sir, no sir. No, sir. No, yes, uh, uh, Droopy was asking when the next home game is. It's April twenty eighth, so it's the next home game. So hopefully, you guys make it. I believe the season tickets for the um, the beer snake section is sold out. I don't know if they have individual um, seats, but beer yeah. snake section sold out. That's the rowdy section. Listen, very rowdy. Let's get into this real quick. So I told you it was a heck of a weekend, right? Defenders won. Caps didn't do so great, but I'm gonna tell you what did happen. WrestleMania happened on Saturday. And Sunday, 40 wow. WrestleMania 40. WrestleMania 40 no was out there. Yeah, listen. Uh no, no, no <laughs> droop. No droop. Look, droop's already saying send me money pick. <laughs> no, no droop. You gotta catch her at a defender's game. Right. At a defender's game. You not not that you already have a picture with her. With her. No, <laughs> no droop. Send me the money. <laughs> send me the money. No, listen. So you uh, never see me in no defender's game. The 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 WrestleMania went down, so y'all know every now and again I get down with wrestling. Um, it was an outstanding, outstanding uh, uh, event. Lady A told us when her cousin was up, she so we could watch. You know Roman Reigns and and The Rock. They whooped Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins really, really bad on mm. Saturday. Yes, on Saturday, on Saturday Sunday. Hey. It was Cody's show. Oh, oh hey. Cody did his thing. We don't want to talk about that. Roman Reigns held the title for over a thousand days. Over That's not a my thousand cousin. days. It's my cousin is greatness. Uh, over a thousand days. That's that's pretty impressive. And, and I know that you guys are gonna say, "Hey, wrestling's fake and all this stuff." It's the storylines that you have to get into. Entertainment. Not well, only that, it's not just the storylines, pick. These gentlemen and ladies, they, they put are. Their bodies. They are, well, they're athletic, yeah, and they it takes a lot to lift a big old 300 pound man over your head. It takes a lot to throw a person, it, it's athleticism. I mean, if that you like bonus. stunts and you know, stunt man, and you know, you like those type of things, that's for you. Yeah. Also, we saw the uh, WWE debut for Storm. I don't know if you guys, but she's the next big thing. You had 
Bianca Belair, Naomi, uh, who's Jay, uh, Jay Uso's uh, wife, Jay, Jimmy, one of the one of the wives. And, and they, Storm. they were there. Those are my cousins as well. Um, they're Rikishi's children, if y'all yeah, don't know. <laughs> um, for the old people who know who Rikishi is, that's his and Cody Rhodes is um Dusty's child. Yep. If y'all didn't know. So you got some children in there. Look, look at Sid's face. Look at Sid's face right there. Sid's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I know who Dustin Rose is. I know who Cody is. Mm-hmm. And Dustin Rose is the other one son. When the one in between there? Dustin yeah. Rose. Yeah, Dustin. Dustin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, um, you know, you had you yeah. have a Hall of Fame on Friday, which was really great. You see a lot of um, Muhammad Ali. old heads coming through. Um Muhammad Ali's uh, widow gave uh, The Rock uh, a championship belt. Um, you know, it, it was pretty good. It was it was pretty good. I will say that um, a lot of celebrities were there. Mm-hmm. I don't know why they always insist on having Snoop be a commentator, but if you, never see, if you never see guy. Snoop be a commentator, That's my guy. you might want to just check that out real quick. Um but it was it's it's entertainment, but it draws the crowds. Yeah, yeah, it they did. Not- they broke some good records. So uh, that was WrestleMania. So uh, exactly. and it, it was it was great. Uh, that is our show for today. Um, we covered all bases, right, Sam? Yes, sir. All right. So Saturday, listen. Saturday, we have uh, Nate from Ref the District. Uh, he'll be with us. We'll we'll get into a little draft. And next Tuesday, I'm gonna see. I got to check because he's very, very busy. I'm going to see if I can get Adam on here, our, our draft guy from uh, from the Burgundy Go- Burgundy uh, report. We'll, we'll see if we can get Adam on next week to uh, break down a, l- a little bit of this draft. As we go, then we'll be two weeks away from the NFL draft. Um, Alvin, one question for you, man. What hat do you have on right there? Julius Chestnut. JC Sports, baby, for Julius Chestnut. Um, it goes jbirdsports.com. You can get your hat, shirts and other paraphernalia all the time online. All right. So we will have JC coming back on. That's Julius Chestnut because uh, he has some things that will be happening in DMV. We'll tell you about those. We'll mm-hmm. let him break it down for you. But we'll be having Julius come back, PG product, uh, a, P, a product of PG County. So mm-hmm. make sure you all stay tuned for that as well. So once again, we got Nate from Rep the District on Sunday, and we're going to see if we can get Adam on from Bleeding Burgundy. Uh, from the Burgundy Report, Burgundy Gold Report. Well, oh, man, I'm messing everything up right now. Thank you all for watching the show. Good are you guys doing the show? show? Uh, yeah. Drew asked, are we doing the draft day show? Are we doing the draft day show April 25th? That's the plan, Drew. That's the plan for right now. You know, we'll be on here. We'll get our snacks on. We'll we'll be ready. That's the plan, you know. And uh, maybe, maybe Sato will go into his giveaway bag and, and break some out for you. Who knows? We'll, we'll find out here in a little bit. All right. Shout out to my son, United States Air Force. First three podcasts, second to none. Come get some. Tell him, say it. Go, dogs. Got the button ready. Hail.